Sex with Emily is looking for a new senior podcast producer. We are sorry to say goodbye to Erica, but she is leaving to pursue her music career, and I know she's going to have much success. We are looking for a senior producer right now that can start and help us with content production. You have technical expertise. You know how to manage a team. You can collaborate, and you have experience working in production with audio or podcasting and video. And you're also familiar with the content because you're listening to the show. Send your cover letter and resume to jobs at sexwithemily.com. We'd love to have you join our growing team and we have a good time over here. Thank you. I understand waiting until you get married to have sex is a personal choice. And the challenge around that is we don't know about sex until we have sex. It's like someone saying, choose your three favorite foods and that's all you can have for the rest of your life, but you've never tried these foods. (laughs) You're like, okay, I guess pizza looks good. And then you make tomato sauce and then you're screwed because you get pizza. You're listening to Sex with Emily. I'm Dr. Emily, and I'm here to help you prioritize your pleasure and liberate the conversation around sex. Ever wondered, am I the asshole for watching porn without my partner knowing? Or am I the asshole for feeling a little misled about our sex life before we walk down the aisle? Or how about, am I the asshole for just feeling plain bored with our sex life? Well, you're not alone. Today, producer Eric and I read your Am I the Asshole questions and let you know if you're approaching asshole territory. If you're wondering if you're an asshole, send us your Am I the Asshole questions for the chance to have yours featured on the show. It's sexwithemily.com slash A-I-T-A. Please rate and review Sex with Emily wherever you listen to the show. My new articles, how to give a prostate massage, and 15 sex toys that make amazing Valentine's Day gifts are up on sexwithemily.com. All right, everyone, enjoy this episode. By now, you've probably heard my magic wand story. It's a brand that's been part of my personal journey for more than 20 years. But no matter how many times I sing magic wand's praises, I'll never be able to fully capture the story of this incredible brand. Well, now journalist and author Kate Sloan just completed a limited audio series documenting the history and impact that magic wand has created over the last 56 years. It's called Making Magic. And the series chronicles Magic Wand's incredible brand story through interviews with nearly 40 experts, performers, business owners, educators, and fans. So I got a sneak preview of the series. And what I loved is that Kate weaves together snippets from all their interviews into this amazing story arc. She covers Magic Wand's journey from appliance store massager to its legendary influence on culture and sexual independence. And it's all just fascinating. The first episodes of Making Magic are available now at makingmagicseries.com or on all popular podcast platforms. Just search for Making Magic or visit makingmagicseries.com today. This is from Anonymous. He's 52. Hey, Dr. Emily, my wife and I have been together for 20 years, 15 married, both in our 50s. Am I the asshole for hiding strip club visits and porn use from her because I'm using them to get turned on before sex? Okay, Mr. Anonymous. Well, here's my question. Have you thought about why are you hiding it? Are you hiding it because she's expressed that she doesn't feel okay with porn use in strip clubs? Was it something that she's, you know, in the past, she caught you, they use, people use this language a lot in, in relationships, I caught a masturbating, I caught him doing that. Is that one of the reasons why? Because then I always think this could also be a great time to collaborate, which is one of my pillars of sex IQ that I talk about in my book, Smart Sex, that came out last year. How is your conversation around sex? Because I'm wondering if you've been together for 20 years, if there's some more depth and conversation the two of you can have around your sex life that could help make it a lot richer, more connected, or if you guys aren't really talking about it. And so that is the reason why you need strip clubs and porn use to get turned on because talking about sex or exploring your sex life after 20 years is a no-go for her. I'm wondering about that. That's just a flag for me. Maybe it's a pink flag. I would say it's a red flag, but it's a burgundy flag. I don't know, you an asshole. I just think the word hiding makes me feel like after 20 years... I know there's sometimes mysteries really hot in a relationship, but 
How do you feel about the hiding? Like, do you feel any shame around it? Are you worried if you'll get caught? Is it really the only thing that turns you on before sex? Could you get curious and explore some other things that might get you turned on before sex so you're not really hiding this strip club business in porn use? And maybe if you do start to talk to her about your sex life in a really open, curious, collaborative way, you might find that she might be open to some things that you are too. And that maybe there are some new places you can go after 20 years. When I read this, I think porn use, absolutely. Everyone should watch porn. If it turns them on, it doesn't mean you're wrong. Even if you're in a relationship. When I think hiding strip club visits, I initially think asshole. Yeah. Do you feel like guys who go to strip clubs are assholes or just hiding it? Hiding it. Your answer was much more open-minded than <laughs> my initial reaction. Well, no, I love to yeah. hear. This is the truth. We're being real here. So <laughs> – because when you think of strip clubs, what do you think about? Well, as you were speaking, yeah. I was thinking to myself, I guess why is it different if in both cases you're watching someone else and you're not engaging with them? I guess because strip clubs just feel more personal to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is something like you're leaving the house. You're, I mean, is he getting yeah. lap dances? Right. Is he spending money if they would be using on their family vacation on strippers? Right. Like, are you just going and having a cocktail and leaving? Is like a quick drive-by and you're sitting at the bar looking at someone dance and then getting home? Or are you having more of an elaborate right. experience? And I'm also up? thinking, okay, if he's using them to get turned on for sex, maybe he his arousal lasts the duration of the car ride back to the <laughs> right. house. But like I'm kind of like, really? Is like, it a drive through yeah. strip club? Um, which actually isn't a bad idea. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. Strip club usually connotes like something a little bit more like sleazier and a little bit more like subversive. And since we're not on the call with him, which I would love if people would start to, you know, you guys can still leave messages on our hotline and we can chat about things. You know, I just think this is an opportunity to sort of have the conversations that I always talk about on the show with your wife about it. 20 years in, happy anniversary. What can we do the next 50 years we're together to explore our sex life? Because I'm just feeling, again, if there's hiding, that maybe there's something else to explore. And I'm also guessing from my 20 years of doing this that she might have shamed him in the past. She might have mm. said, I don't want you watching porn. I don't want you going to strip clubs. But let me remind you, there's a lot of great porn out there now that's made by women for women, like Erica Less porn, that she might find her arousal in porn, watching porn that actually does turn her on. So mm -hmm. I don't know. People can change. People can grow. Like maybe it's time to revisit the conversation that has made you want to hide this. Now, the other thing is maybe part of your arousal, Anonymous, is that like you like the secret of nature of it. Right. You like that like she doesn't know and I'm getting away with something and that is fueling your turn on. So you're not an asshole. Just try to have some good conversations here. And what if your neighbor sees you at a strip club? Like what if she found, how would you feel, you know, if right. someone found you? And the porn use is, you know, again, I, I love when couples talk about their porn use, but I also know from talking to many, many long married couples that they, most couples have never talked about masturbation their masturbation practices, mm -hmm. and they use porn in secret. But I'm all about freeing porn, liberating the sex conversation. So I'd love you to have some real chats with your wife. I have a question. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> there are so many options for ethical porn sites now. Are there options for ethical strip clubs? And I'm all in support of sex workers doing their thing. To me, Maybe this is still a, an uneducated belief that I just think of strip clubs as having a little um, different of a power dynamic than maybe someone having their own OnlyFans. Well, I guess in historically they have. Historically, many strip clubs have been less beneficial to women in some ways. Although, you know, there's also a lot of women who actually really get – I was thinking about my friend's – show on Vice right now called mm. Sex Before the Internet. Yes, yes. And there's a whole thing about the Gold Club and the 80s. And you guys should check out this series. It really does sort of, you forget what sex was like before the internet. I mean, you, you like sex built the internet, but really you had to go to strip club. You had to do everything in person. Um, nothing was online. But the point is like a lot of the dancers from that time talk about the freedom they had to make their own money. Mm. They felt taken care of by the strip club owners. I mean, there was probably, I'm sure there's 
experience of like violence and things that happened, but they were able to make a lot of money by taking their clothes off and many felt that they were treated well and equitably. Although a lot of the clubs were owned by men who probably made way more money than they did and they might not have been always treated the best way. But ethical porn clubs, I guess, are basically probably have gone online to OnlyFans. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good note. I guess the most ethical one is when someone's really in charge of her own business. Yeah. No, I don't hear about strip clubs as much as more, to be honest. Uh, I feel like I know that they're here in LA. And then mm -hmm. when I lived in San Francisco in the, the 90s, it was like in Mitchell Brothers and there was all these places. And I would go talk to the dancers. I remember one of my first interviews was going there and they were just like, I love my job. I make good money. I, I love dancing. It makes me feel good. Yeah. It turns me on. Now, there is probably some stuff that goes on in the back room and you get hand jobs or people have sex. I know that stuff has happened. But for a lot of the dancers are like, I'm raising my child. I'm able to make more money than I was able to make doing anything else. I feel safe. There's bodyguards. Mm -hmm. So and it yeah. really is just dancing. It is just dancing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there's stories of like strip clubs and all the other things, but a lot of it is literally just dancing. Mm -hmm. And there are bodyguards and they're dancing. Maybe they just you know, feel good in their bodies. But yeah, so much has changed in the world right yeah. now that, you know. I could so see that. I mean, pole dancing classes are so popular now. And it's literally just a room full of, it's almost like taking a yoga class. It's yeah. like taking a pole dancing class, but you're getting in touch with both your athleticism and your eroticism. Yeah. Women who have done it are like, I feel so sexy. I feel in my body. I feel empowered. I feel like I'm in charge of my sexuality and I feel in touch with it. So mm -hmm. all that. All right, Anonymous, let us know how it goes with the conversations. We'll be here for you. This is from Lori61 in Nebraska. Am I the asshole for wanting more physical touch from my partner? Hi, Dr. Emily. My love language is touch. There are times when it is totally obvious to me while in bed with my 68-year-old husband of 36 years that he is purposely avoiding touching me in even the slightest intimate way. He drapes his lifeless arm under my breasts or across my abdomen, not moving at all. We've talked about it, and I admit that it feels as if it's a stop sign. He in turn admits that he sometimes avoids touching me in a pleasurable way because he doesn't want to raise my expectations, turn me on, or encourage me. We have a huge Huge variance in sex drive. I have tried to talk to him about it and explain that I often feel more like a roommate or a sister in bed next to him because of the lack of desire that's evident. I've asked him to help offset the lopsidedness by pleasuring me sometimes, quickly, or with a toy perhaps, when he's not in the mood for receiving pleasure. He only wants to be intimate when relations are imminent. I can't complain because we have sex on average two times a week, but he doesn't communicate or convey love through touch at any point other time. Am I the asshole for wanting more physical touch? Wow. 36 years together, you guys are certainly in a dynamic that is very, very set in its ways. And your sex drives have certainly fluctuated over time. It sounds like maybe you've always had the higher sex drive. It sounds like he might be willing to give you the kind of touch you want if he knew that he wouldn't be pressured into it leading to more. Because I feel like what you're asking here is for more non-sexual touch. That's what I got from this. Because you're having sex twice a week. So you just want him to be able to like come up, kiss your neck, play with your breasts. But maybe an assurance from you that, babe, it's okay. We don't have sex. I just need the touch. And so maybe he doesn't quite get what that looks like or doesn't believe that it could be. So maybe you could say you could start by demonstrating to him what you need. You could say to him, I'd really love to cuddle right now or I'd love to make out for a second, but I don't need this to go any further. Mm -hmm. And just by stating that in the moment and showing him that touch doesn't have to go anywhere, you're not going to pressure him to take it to another place, might allow him to feel safer with touch throughout the week that isn't just about sex. But maybe he needs that little bit of example from you showing him how it might go down. I can definitely relate to that as someone who has been the lower libido partner in a relationship where anytime my partner touched me, I always loved touch, but there was always something in my mind where I was like, "Ugh, is this about to be like the next hour? Is this you want more than this? And so then it, it wouldn't allow me to enjoy that touch as much. And if we had had these conversations and just been like, I don't always crave this, you know, I, but I do feel like I understand you have a lower libido, but I do need more intimacy than what we're having. Yeah. 
And that's really common, Erica, too. You always hear these situations with couples like, oh, God, you get the dick in the back. Your partner rolls over and you're like, what does it mean? And, oh, God, I don't have time or I'm with the kids. And so this is a common situation that people get into in relationships where they're like, I don't want to give into this touch because I don't want it to lead to sex. Mm -hmm. And so, again, just like naming it for what it is. And you can make it playful. It's not like you would be like, wait, before we make out again for another second, let's be clear. This is not leading to penetrative sex. You can just make it fun. And again... I've done this with my partner. Like both of us have done it. We're like, nope, let's just play right now. Like I just want to make out for a second. We're not having sex tonight. Like we just call it yeah. because we talk about it. I'm like, oh, okay. Cause so you do call it out in the moment. It, we do. We oh. call it. I'm like, no, my partner and I do. Like, we call it out all the time. How like, do you do that? Touch is our love language for both of us. Yeah. And we both love touch. Sometimes I'll just be like, or let's just cuddle tonight. Or let's just, tonight I'll pleasure you. You'll pleasure me. I practice what I preach here and that we talk about it also. It looks like just come sit on my lap. We don't have to do anything else. Or let's just cuddle here. Or let's just be naked. But I'm with you. Like, we don't have time. We're both exhausted. We're going to mm -hmm. get up early. We just name it. We talk about what is going to happen with touch because touch is very confusing. Now, sometimes you know that it's just non-sexual touch. But yeah, sometimes it it isn't clear. So we literally just call it. And sometimes we're pleasantly surprised. He'll say, like, no, we don't have time now. I don't want it now. And then it will turn into sex. So, right. But again, only because we really want to. Right. <laughs> Right. So I'm like, what do you mean we're not having sex? <laughs> of course we're having sex. Like in every other area of our right. life, we clarify things. But with touch, most of the times or sexual touch or intimate touch leading to sex, it can be very confusing in relationships. Mm -hmm. And it can also lead to us giving into sex when we don't want to or maybe thinking our partner wants it. Maybe they just want that too. So I think that everyone who's in any kind of relationship right now intimately should have that conversation with their partner because I think this is a really common scenario and we don't often talk about it, but it just becomes very uncomfortable. And what happens is in long-term relationships, sometimes couples just stop touching and they're not even that in touch with why they stop touching. Right. And usually it's because of this is the culprit. And then I'm sure that translates to when you do have actual sex, it feels more mechanical and less intimate. Because you haven't had the precursor yeah. of touch. And then you miss touch at other times. Remember, you guys, we can go without sex for a really long time. You can go without intimacy. You can go without orgasm, really, even though it's good for you. But we as humans really don't do very well without touch. We require touch to be, to feel connected. It's good for our nervous system. It calms us. It stimulates feel-good hormones. So actually, I think understanding your relationship to touch within a relationship is really important work for a lot of couples. I appreciate all your questions, but Lori, I think this is a really important question, and I think it's really going to help a lot of people. Thanks, Lori. Let us know how it goes. Again, sometimes our partners, we need to lead by example and show mm -hmm. them what we need and how to manage it. Stick around, assholes. We'll be right back answering more Am I the Asshole questions after a quick break. But first, I want to tell you about Promescent. I've been telling you about Promescent for over 10 years now. Promescent makes the very best delay spray on the market. The only one you should even consider is for any penis owner looking to delay their orgasms. This is the spray I recommend. It can help penis owners last up to 64% longer in bed. It's long lasting. It doesn't transfer to your partner. You just apply it a few minutes before any sexual activity. You wait about 10 minutes. It gives you confidence in the bedroom. If you struggle with premature ejaculation, you want to practice edging, or you just want longer, more intimate sessions with a partner. They also have this incredible warming arousal gel for vulva owners, which I love. You just put a few drops on, you rub it on your vulva, your clitoris, and then you get this tingly sensation, which starts to increase blood flow, which means you're getting more aroused, turned on, leads to your orgasm. It's just like, oh yeah, I'm ready. This feels good. I put it on before partnered sex, solo sex or even during the day sometimes just for you know a little pick me up and if you want more pleasure for both you and your partners go to promescent.com slash emily to save 15 percent off your order that's p-r-o-m-e-s-c-e-n-t dot com slash emily or just click the link in the show notes for 15 percent off all right i'll be right back This is from Andrew. He's 30. Am I the asshole for feeling misled about my wife's sex drive when we were dating? Hey, Dr. Emily, my wife, 32, and I've been married for five years, and we waited until we were married to have sex together. While we were engaged, we occasionally brought up the topic of sex and both voiced that we wanted to have sex pretty frequently. 
multiple times per week. However, right after the honeymoon, my wife's sex drive just plummeted. And since then, we pretty consistently only have sex once every four to six weeks. My wife says that sex just isn't a priority for her and it turns her off and stresses her out that I always try to initiate sex with her. She does have sexual abuse trauma from a previous relationship and is on SSRIs to manage pretty severe anxiety, which I recognize both affects her libido, but she is aggressively against going to any form of counseling and has gotten to the point where she is pretty vicious in her rejections when I try and initiate. I go to marriage counseling by myself to try and work on my issues, but I feel so dejected because physical touch is my love language and I have a very high sex drive on top of that and she's not into physical affection of any kind and could probably never have sex again and would be quite content. Am I the asshole for feeling a bit misled when we were dating? Andrew, my heart goes out to you. I understand waiting until you get married to have sex is a personal choice and it's common that couples do this for many reasons. Could be they're operating culturally. The challenge around that is we don't know about sex until we have sex. It's like someone saying, choose your three favorite foods and that's all you can have for the rest of your life, but you've never tried these foods. (laughs) You're like, okay, I guess pizza looks good. And then you (laughs) make tomato sauce and then you're screwed because you get pizza. You know what I mean? Okay, but that's just a side note rant. Here's the thing, Andrew. What I'm going to zero in on is the fact that she has sexual abuse, she's on SSRIs. That is an area where everything needs to start, that she's got to truly work on herself. Now, I know that she is against any form of counseling. Many people start that way. I mean, at this point though, it's 2024. Mental health has been a movement Mm -hmm. the last few years. I actually think it's way less stigma to going to therapy, being on antidepressants. And so... But I'm going to say, say say the same thing I've always said. It's like, does she need more information about it? Does she have any friends that, you know, she could speak with? Does she have any people in her life, Andrew, that you think could perhaps get her to the point where she realizes that it's actually going to help her life in every area, not just sex? What I'm guessing is that, and what I know is, that this abuse and her anxiety is showing up everywhere, mm-hmm. not just in the bedroom. You say here, are you an asshole for feeling misled when we were dating? I don't think she was misleading you. I think that everything she probably heard about sex and knew about sex is it's supposed to be this wonderfully pleasurable thing. And for her, it hasn't been because it brought up trauma. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that's when we realize our traumas when we're in a situation where the memories come back to us. You're doing your work, which I love, because that's also what I often tell people. If your partner won't go, definitely go take care of yourself. And we really can't make our partners do anything. But perhaps if she starts to see the benefits that you're getting from your therapy and sharing things with her, maybe that could help. I am hoping in this committed relationship, you've only been together five years, that there's a way that you could even say to her, perhaps I'm just spitballing here, take sex off the table and say, I love you as your husband. I care about you and your mental health. And I just think this would be a really important for you to go see somebody and kind of work on these, you know, challenges you've had and make it more about a we thing and a her thing than it is about you having sex. Maybe her experience with sex is so painful and horrific because she's got this trauma that perhaps she's afraid if she gets help, then then she's going to have to have this sex thing that she doesn't like. So she's like, why would I get help for it when now I have to have sex and it hasn't been a great experience? Not because you're not trying, Andrew, because of her trauma and the antidepressants. It's like a one-two punch. She's had sexual trauma that's reared its head and SSRIs or antidepressants, they can just slash our libido. Like we don't feel anything. There's no sensitivity. When you touch her, she really might feel numb. And I know you talked about it when you were engaged and you brought up the topic of sex, but she just didn't know what it was then. She hadn't experienced it. And so if you could kind of help her wrap her head around her severe anxiety to deal with that, the best way to deal with severe anxiety is actually getting to see a therapist, working on her medication seeing if it is the right dose for her. And then also, you know, breath work, yoga, taking care of herself. But a lot of it starts with therapy. I could see that being really difficult because he says she's aggressively against going to any form of counseling. She's pretty vicious in her rejections when he tries to initiate. He says, I go to marriage counseling by myself and try to work on my issues, but I feel so dejected because physical touch is my love language. Mm. Yeah. That's really hard. I feel like it's so for him beyond the sex and just feeling a disconnect from his partner. And I think that's 
what you can bring up to your wife more importantly. Say, it's, I'm not trying to have hours and hours of sex with you. That's not why I think it would be beneficial for you to go to therapy. It's more like, first, it would be beneficial for your own growth as an individual, but also just for our longevity as a couple. Yeah. As a way to connect, as a way to feel safe with each other. Because you're only 30. You got married at 25. You've got a long life of the two of you guys together. Hopefully. You got to address these issues. Yeah. I mean, I think that is a great thing to say to her that it's not about the sex. It's just about touch and intimacy. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that that's, those are two different things. I mean, intimacy is the umbrella term and sex falls under that, but just hand-holding, touch, massage, and all of that's really important. So letting her know that your intimacy and connection is important because, yeah, the fact that she's vicious and aggressive, viciously responding and aggressive is is, is worrisome. So that's our tone too. Mm-hmm. So think about your tone and think about how you could talk to her in a way that feels comforting and supportive and so she feels safe that this is really about enhancing your relationship together. Because I could totally understand if sex – feels like the scary thing of course it's just a defense mechanism to defend yourself to defend this scary thing from happening she's definitely not an asshole by any means for being vicious or i think the more you can be understanding with her while also emphasizing how it's important for the two of your connection that would be really important when someone does respond so aggressively and so viciously to something it's usually a sign that this, whatever the triggering thing was, is so deeply troubling Mm -hmm. for the person. Like the more intense our response means that there's just a lot that's underlying that, right? When someone gets really angry, it doesn't really seem commensurate with the act. And you're like, with something that happened, it's because she's in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. She's in a lot of pain. So let's see what we can do to get her there. You guys are young. And uh, you've made a commitment to each other. So let's see how you can kind of learn to change the way you speak with her and let us know what happens. We're here for you. Thank you, Andrew. This is from Sydney. She's 23. Am I the asshole for being bored with our sex life? Hi, Dr. Emily. When I started dating my boyfriend, we had sex a lot, but I was more of a performer and faked it a lot, but I was having fun. Now I have almost no desire for sex. He's good and we have okay communication. It's slowly improved over time. I'm the problem. My personality is very ADHD. I'm driven by novelty and I've never been attracted to people for very long. I love him, but I think I'm just bored and I don't know how to reawaken sexual interest. When I'm not in the mood, sex is painful and I'm not good at stopping it once it starts. So I start to just avoid it at all costs. People pleaser. I'm now at the point where I'm kind of just grossed out by most sexual things. Smell, semen, giving head. But I also think I built up some tally in my head where I feel like he owes me. And so that also plays into me not wanting to give him head in cases where I'm scared of penetration or it hurts. Also, I'm sure the reaction to this is, boy, this girl needs therapy. I do go to therapy, but I haven't been able to open up about this. I struggle because I feel guilty for not giving him a sex life, but sometimes he's insensitive, saying I should be able to fix my problem. I'm trying and it's extremely frustrating having this problem. I feel like an asshole. So, Sydney, where I'm missing the loop here is that you're a performer and you faked it but you're having fun. You stopped faking it being a performer, but have you found yet the step after faking it and having performative sex is then going into our bodies and feeling what we do like, what feels good to us, what turns us on. And so I'm wondering if that piece is missing. Do you know what you like, what your turn-ons are, what feel good to you? And then you've built up a tally in your head where he owes you. What do you think he owes you? Does he owe you more? Like what? in your relationship. So Mm -hmm. it does sound a little bit, this isn't just about the sex. It sounds like there's some other relationship dynamics. And if you are in therapy, I highly recommend opening up about this in therapy. And you probably have to make sure that your therapist is someone who's comfortable having these kinds of conversations. Unfortunately, many therapists Mm -hmm. are not. Hopefully they're getting trained in it now, but it's not that common that they are, but I don't know where you live. Sex problems are not one person's problem. So for him to say you should fix your problem isn't fair because it takes two of you to create a sex life. It sounds like there's definitely a collaboration issue here. You guys are not really able to yet have a healthy conversation about what you both want, what your desires are, what your turn-ons, what your blocks are, what actually feels good to you, what does give you pleasure. And I'm wondering if you've figured that out yet. I hear what you say about not stopping sex once it starts, 
You're allowed to stop sex whenever you want. We all are. I think we were all told growing up, especially with vulva, that, you know, there's so much momentum and your partner has an erection and you should keep going, but we don't have to do that. So maybe there's a way that you guys could slow everything down, take a little bit of foreplay and penetration off the table, which you, sounds like you already have, and get to know each other on like a more touch level and a more arousal level, just kissing, making out, giving each other a massage. That might really help you start to be in your body, start to see what feels good. And I'm wondering also, have you shared with your partner that you were faking it, faking everything, faking pleasing? Mm -hmm. And that's okay to do that. You're, you know, you're young, you're 23 years old. Like you probably haven't had that many partners. And I don't even mean quantity. Like maybe you're going to say, yeah, I've slept with a lot of people. It doesn't mean it sounds like they were all like less than satisfying. So you still got a lot of learning to do. He probably does too. Can you guys go on a sexual journey together where you're both really open about where you're at, what you know at this point in life and kind of build together? That's what I want for you. I want some more conversations about you being really real and really honest and really truthful to him about what's actually going on with your body, with your thoughts about sex and what you truly desire and have him open up as well. You guys are in it together. I'm kind of wondering, is that an asshole move for him to put it all on her? Or is it understandably frustrating if, you know, Sydney, it's totally okay that you have more work to do to feel comfortable sexually. So many people do. But if you're with someone who has let go of all that shame, that is also frustrating. And I feel like it's okay to acknowledge mm -hmm. that for your partner. Hey, I appreciate you being patient with me. I need you to continue doing that yeah. and not putting the pressure on me because that's not going to make me get rid of my shame any faster. Yeah, absolutely. Like, thank him. Thank him for patience. Like, thank him for listening. Thank him for, like, being a good partner, for learning to explore with you and go slow. But you have to let him know what you need. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to explain it. And I get you might not know what you need. I don't know how your relationship is in other ways and how you communicate, but there's a lot to be said for just, hey, I've... I really want to talk to you about this. I love our relationship. These are all the things that I think are wonderful about it. I know we're struggling sexually. And here's what I'm going through right now. So what I might need from you for it to start to heal again is to go really slow, to go back to just touching, to just making out, to more oral sex on me. That's what you want. It's all an energy exchange. And so the more you can open up your vulnerability to him, he might come in and be able to sort of hear it from a place of, you know, respect and kindness and love. Or he might get defensive too. So this is all communication work, but I think it's more of a, well, it is a sex challenge, but it's also just how you guys can communicate and really learn to hear each other so you all get your needs met together. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that you're an asshole, but I do think your avoidant behaviors and telling in your head and going to therapy and not talking about sex is just hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're being an asshole to yourself, but we love you. <laughs> Sydney, keep us posted. Thanks for your questions so much. That's it for today's episode. See you on Tuesday. Thanks for listening to Sex with Emily. Be sure to like, subscribe, and give us a review wherever you listen to the podcast and share this with a friend or partner. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sex with Emily. Oh, I've been told I give really good email. So sign up at sexwithemily.com. And while you're there, check out my free guides and articles for more ways to prioritize your pleasure. If you'd like to ask me about your sex life, dating, or relationships, call my hotline, 559-TALK-SEX. That's 559-825-5739. Or go to sexwithemily.com slash askemily. Was it good for you? Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com. <laughs>